Hi, everyone. Uh, obviously, already stated, my name is Jeff Lazell. I'm here from x -Ride Color Management, which is a set of tools, basically, for making sure that you're getting the correct color out of your camera, on your screen, on your printer, on your scanner, pretty much anything we can go over. But before we get really into that, just a little bit background on me and why I'm here and why x -Ride sends me here. Uh, before I worked with this company, I ran the production department for a wedding studio here in New York City. And so I did retouching, I did printing, I did assisting, I did shooting, I did pretty much every side of the business there, but mainly I settled in in the production department. And one of the most important things I did there, and what I learned there, is setting up a workflow. And you know, everyone's workflow is gonna be a little bit different. Everyone has different uh, imaging needs, everyone has different output needs, stuff like that. But what I wanna do today is just show you guys basically how to set up your own, give you a little tutorial about what you need to look for, what you need to know, and also uh, what you're doing when you make choices. You know, there's a lot of choices you have to make when you're going through the software, when you're going through setting up a workflow. And in my opinion, uh, a lot of times it's not really well explained. A lot of times people are making choices just because they read on an internet forum, this is the choice you make. So I hope today to just sort of arm you uh, with information and some tools uh, that'll help you along the way to make sure you get the highest quality output, whether it be a print from a lab, a print from an inkjet printer, or even just a, a website portfolio that you can. Now, again, a little bit of background about where I got to where I am. Uh, when I worked for the wedding studio, uh, we had, uh, I'd say like on an average weekend, we probably had six shooters out there. We were, we're a pretty high volume studio. So that is six different cameras, and each one of those cameras had a different idea about what true color was. So Monday morning, six different versions of color coming in that I would have to deal with. But really in truth, you know, we would have second shooters on the job. Every one of those photographers should have at least one camera. Obviously you need a backup camera in case something goes wrong on someone's wedding. So more accurately, I would guess I probably had 12 different versions of color coming in Monday morning for us to work with. Now once those files come out of the camera, 12 different cameras, I had uh, two guys in the production department that just worked on converting RAWs. And then we had some photographers that would convert their own RAWs. So that's five different monitors, each with a different version of color that these files are being worked on. And then after that, the files would then go down to retouching. And that's another five monitors. You know, I was retouching. I had another in-house retoucher with me. And then we had some out-of-house retouchers that I didn't even have access to their monitor. Another five different versions of color. Then, you know, it's, it's done. It's approved, the client likes it, and now it's time to go to print. We worked with three different labs across the country, depending on what the client wanted, depending on what the needs were. So that's three new versions of color on the output side. Or, for whatever reason, we have to print in-house. Uh, say there was a rush, or there was a damaged print, or something special. Well, sometimes the uh, customer would want a really nice canvas print. We'd print those in-house. I had two Epson 3880s and a 9900 to work with. So that is three more versions of color I had to deal with. So now I have this giant chain, right, where at the top there, before all those cameras, uh, one couple spent a very long time picking out very specific colors for what they were wearing, for their flowers, all that sort of stuff. And so that color has to come out down here looking like what they wanted it to look like, which is a lot to keep track of, and mainly, as I always say, the drive for me here was not getting yelled at. I did not want to get in trouble for spending money and time and effort on a print that came out looking nothing like they remembered. So that's where really this was born, me building this workflow over years, making mistakes, dealing with new technologies to make sure everything came through on time and we saved money and effort. Now, before we start diving into it even further, I have a few questions for you guys. So who here captures in RAW? All right, it's not bad. So for everything I'm gonna talk about today to be fully effective, a RAW capture is essential. Uh, the reason there is when you set your camera to capture in JPEG, uh, you're pretty much giving it permission to throw out all the information it thinks you don't need or will ever need. So when we start you know, diving into these softwares and start dealing with color, a lot of that color information that we want to adjust, that we want to use for a calibration, is just thrown out. It's just not there. Not to mention things that we're going to go into like bit depth are gone as well. 
So for the highest quality output, you really need to start with a raw file. And the next question is always the more loaded question. Who here regularly calibrates their monitor? Oh, all right. Got two people out there. So anytime we begin to talk about color in any visual medium, uh, photography, videography, graphic design, uh, a properly calibrated monitor is essential. And the really simple reason there is you need to know what you're seeing is actually the color in the file, not the settings on the monitor. Which is to say, so you take a photo and you nail it in camera. You really like the way it came out, and you're looking at it, you bring it onto the computer, and once you bring it onto your computer, it looks a little bit green. And you know, you say to yourself, well, well, you can't really trust the back, the little LCD screen on the back of a camera. Maybe it was a little off, maybe my white balance wasn't where I thought it was. So you start adding in some magenta, and you bring it back to how you remember seeing it on your screen. But then, uh, say you go to print, and what you get back looks like someone spilled Kool-Aid all over it. That's because you're adding magenta in to compensate for the monitor settings, not for what was actually in the file. So um, I think a lot of the reasons uh, people don't calibrate their monitor, uh, first is people don't know about it, which is why I'm here today. And then once they know about it, it sounds like a really involved process. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift out of my presentation really quick, and we're going to start the process of calibrating a monitor so you guys can see how not scary it actually is. So this class today, uh, we're using the i1 series of devices. So I'm going to start with the i1 Display Pro, which is this little guy right here. The i1 calibrates monitors, projectors, and now mobile devices. And you can see here that it's plugged in. If you look up there, the licensing pops up. And there's green checks by monitor, quality check, and projector. Um, just today, so we will pretend that we're going to do a monitor, just so you guys can see it. I know because we're on both monitors and projectors here. So um, the real benefit of the i1 is the software backing it up. It has both a basic function and an advanced function. So the basic function will take you through just what you need to get started. It's a really, it'll get you very accurate, but it doesn't give you a lot of choices. So what I'll do really quick is I'll show you guys what advanced will do. So when you click on Advanced, you can see things drop down over here. And it adds in some other stuff. It adds in a quality check and a uniformity check. So a quality check is actually going to, after you do the profile, it'll actually do a quick click uh, test on the machine. And it'll compare the results against industry standards. So this is a way of checking that your monitor is healthy and that your profile is being adopted correctly. Now another one up there you can see is uh, uniformity. So is anyone here using like a pretty big monitor, like above like 17 inch, around the 20s, something like that? What uniformity will do is uniformity will actually allow you to check the different quadrants. It's going to look for like highlight, you know, uh, sometimes in the corners, the highlights can flashlight, or you could have vignetting, the opposite. This will let you know that you shouldn't really trust certain things on the edges, or if you have a, a uniform monitor. But just because we're, we're just sticking our toes in today, we're going to go with basic. And I can show you guys that. So we're going to go to Display Profiling. This is where it is. So you can see here, select your display and technology type. That's asking which one you're going to be profiling. If you have multiple monitors attached, there'll be different ones there. So today, there's just the color LCD, which is the screen on my laptop. And there's white point. And you can see that you can change the white points, or you can even measure them and change it. Uh, what a white point is is saying, these colors will look correct under this lighting condition, which is we're in an industry standard, basically. So it's set to D65. That is the industry standard. What it means is these colors will look correct under 6,500 degrees Kelvin lighting, which is, uh, again, a lot of labs. Specifically, if you're printing to a lab, they might have a print proof. If you guys have ever seen it, it's a print proof that's color balanced. So your print comes out, and they view it under that very specific lighting to make sure the colors are correct. And so that's where you're dialing in here. Uh, this is something you would shift if the lab you're working with tells you to, basically. Or if you're going to another process, they might use different white points. For instance, like newsprint might use a different white point. But in general, you can leave it set to D65 if you're doing normal photographic printing. Under that is luminance. So before we even delve into the color problems on monitors, luminance is a very big issue. Uh, display manufacturers, they set up monitors. They know what makes you want to buy it. Poppy colors 
brightness. They want, you know, they know what makes it look good when you walk by it. They make video games look good. They make movies look good. But all those settings are pretty bad for photographic work. So if your luminance is too high, it takes away your ability to judge highlight and shadow detail accurately. So this, you can see the industry standard is around 120. You might have to go a little bit lower for certain types of print matching, but 120 is a good place to start, especially if you're going to be printing or showing on the internet. So when I first bought this laptop, this, the MacBook Retina, I tested it. I did a reading on it before I calibrated it. And it came in at 330. So it was three times too bright for photographic work. So what happens is if you say, you know, back in the wedding industry, which I'll keep going back to because I, I was working in it for so long, white dresses, they look so blown out because the screen is too bright. You think you lost all that detail, all that tooling and stuff like that. And so you see that and you, you burn it back in. You say, oh, you know, she needs to see this dress. You spent so much money on the dress. She wants to see the detail. So you burn it back in, and then you get your print back, and it looks gray because you were burning in when you didn't need to. So that is going to set you right there. And there's also adjust ambient, ambient light smart control. That allows you to adjust the profile based on the ambient light. So that will actually allow the device to read the room you're in and set up the profile appropriately for where you're working. Uh, I'm not going to check that now, obviously, because we're underneath some, some video lighting. But we're just going to go ahead and go to Next. So right here, you can see over here, this is the patch set. Um, normally from the factory, it checks 118 colors. If you were then go into Advanced, like I showed you guys, you can actually up that. So the more colors you check, the more accurate a profile you're going to get. Obviously, that's going to take a little bit longer. So these colors are very specific shades that the device is going to look for. In a, a very simple sense, what it's going to do is it's going to hang off of the monitor, and it's going to say to the video card, I want to see this very specific red. And the video card says, oh, I think it's this. And the device will either go, no, or yes. And it'll do that about 118 times. And what it's doing is seeing how far off or on your monitor is right now from what's called the ICC standard. Um, I'm going to bring that up a lot, the phrase ICC standard. Uh, ICC is the International Color Consortium, which always sounds silly when I say it. It's a silly name, but they're just basically a uh, governing body for color. Uh, is anyone familiar with Pantone? Uh, Pantone does uh, you know, stuff for colors on your, on your shirts, on fabrics, on dyes, on paints. They just basically say, Yes, they basically say, this is this color, this is that color. ICC does the same exact thing for photographic work. It says, this combination of ones and zeros is red. This combination of ones and zeros is green. And that is the standard the industry goes to. And what's a big plus here is, no matter how the lab you're going to, if that's how you're going to print, no matter how they're calibrating, they're calibrating to that standard. Whether you're using our device, another device, they're calibrating to that standard. So you can be sure what you see on your screen is what they're seeing on their screen. Now here, what I would do is I'd hit Start Measurement, and we'd actually hang the device over the screen like that, and it would do its reading. Uh, the i1 is pretty quick. It takes about five to 10 minutes. But again, uh, making you guys sit through flashing colors for five to 10 minutes is, I, I wouldn't do that to you. It's, it's boring even for a lecture on color management. So we're going to pretend that it started flashing colors, and I'm just going to show you what you could see when we're done. There we go. So when it finishes, this is the screen you're going to see. You can see that the patch set has been checked. It's ready to go. You hit Next. Now you can name the profile up top. Normally, I make sure to name the profile with something different, just to differentiate it from the stock profile. This means you can always go back. So say you, uh, your laptop is a multi-purpose device. You edit videos on it, but then that night you want to watch a movie, and you say, hey, I don't want my movie to be calibrated for photographic work. You can always go back to the original one. That's why I make sure to rename the profile. Um, then after that, other thing you have to worry about there is profile reminder. Now I know that no one likes to be nagged by their computer to do anything. I don't. But Recalibration is essential. Uh, this is, there are no monitors out there that will permanently take a calibration. Even if you buy a very, very expensive photo-specific monitor, you have to maintain the calibration. It, it's, it's more like an oil change for a car than anything else. Uh, it's just the nature of running current through a screen. 
they're not going to keep the calibration. So, so f exactly. So for uh, laptops, I'd be say to begin starting at about every two weeks. For a desktop, you could start at around a month. This is just, again, it's a starting point for you. You might find that you need to do it more often. You might find that you can hang out a little bit longer, but you definitely shouldn't go longer than a month without calibrating. And again, that's going to be specific to your gear. Uh, the older a monitor gets, uh, the less it can hold the calibration. Again, it's just the nature. Everything has a cycle. And then on the bottom, there is ambient light monitoring. So what you can actually do is leave the device attached, and it will read the light in the room every five minutes. So this is for people who aren't working in a place of constant lighting conditions. When I worked in production, uh, I worked in a basement. We didn't have to worry about this. I literally never saw the sun. But if you work in a room like that, you can actually leave the device attached, and it will either um, auto-compensate, or it will warn you that the lighting's changed too much, and you can readjust. And after that, what I like to do first is this, the profile is going to be created. It's going to be saved, and you're going to see it for the first time. What I love about the i1 is it gives you these things up there. You can see target, and you can see achieved. So you can see that our white point we were trying to achieve was D65, so 6,500 Kelvin. And it tells us that we got to 6550, which is almost perfect. Then after that, the luminance we were going for was 120, and we achieved 117. Now, after that is the contrast ratio, which was changed from the native contrast ratio to a correct one. Then what I also like about the i1 software is it gives you the ability to do before and afters on all different colors. So I always start with, uh, that's what's called the low key. That's the shadow detail. And that's going to shift a lot. Because as I said, your contrast ratio and your luminance was way up. You're most normally going to find that you're gaining a lot of shadow detail back. And then I always like to go to some problem colors. I usually go to a red or a magenta or something like that. Also the blues to see how they shift. And that's it. Now your monitor is calibrated. And we can begin to start talking a bit more about workflow. And we're going to start going back, step back, to the shooting end. Has anyone ever uh, seen one of these guys before or used one? I have one right here. So this is a color checker passport, the X-ray color checker passport. And very simply put, this is a set of calibration cards for you to include while you're photographing that you can then use after in the post-production to get perfect color. Now it does have a gray card included. This is for setting custom white balances in camera. I always have to just bring this up because uh, the phrase 18% gray has kind of become uh, more colloquial than specific in photographic world. Now, an 18% gray card, this is not 18% gray. An 18% gray card is for setting uh, your meter off of. Now, remember that your meter doesn't really care what the color is. So often, the less expensive 18% gray cards that people buy are really bad for setting a custom white balance because they're not spectrally neutral. The, all of the little tabs on this are spectrally neutral, which means that you can hit it with any kind of colored light, and they won't change. Cheaper gray cards don't really have that. There are also some cheaper gray cards that are green. Because again, it's looking for the value, not the color, because it's for a meter. This is for a white balance. In general, how you use it is you hold it up in whatever lighting you're looking to calibrate for, and you take a photograph of, with your camera filling the frame. And then you kind of have to follow how your specific camera does a custom white balance. Uh, Nikon, it's a combination of buttons. Canon, it's in the menus. But again, that part, unfortunately, you kind of just have to check your uh, owner's manual to see how to do it. Now the next cards are, again, for including while you're photographing. So how you use these is a test shot for every lighting situation you encounter. So if you're going to be photographing me in here, first photo, have me hold this up and then continue shooting like you normally would. Then if we say uh, we go outside, lighting condition changes, or if you change camera bodies, you take another test shot. And then once you bring those raw files that we were talking about earlier, once you bring them in to start working on them in Photoshop or in Lightroom, uh, that's where you're really going to see the power of these little cards. So starting at the top, this top card is a creative white balancing tool, which is a little bit different than the card I was just talking about. I'll show you why. But first, the very top, uh, that's just a set of colors. Those are there for references in two ways. One, to make sure that your colors aren't clipping when you expose it. And another, it's a good visual reference, say, if you're shooting uh, photo uh, photography of uh, product photography that needs a very specific color. Um, I always bring up the Coca-Cola Red. 
Coca-Cola is very, very uptight about the specific red being rendered. So that's a good first spot to know that you're in the ballpark. Then on the bottom, uh, shadow through highlight detail. Again, this is like a visual exposure reference, sort of like the, the blinkies in the camera if you ever turn on an exposure warning. This is just a way to make sure that you're properly exposing the card itself. And in the middle is the white balancing tools. So can you see those two highlighted squares? They have a little nub in them. Those are neutral. So what you do is you can use those in any software that allows you to set a custom white balance with a dropper tool. So take that dropper tool, click on either of those two squares, and it will neutralize your white balance always. Like say, you know, it happens to all of us. We're shooting inside, especially again at, during an event. Shooting inside, something starts stopping outside. You run outside. You don't get a chance to shift your white balance on your camera. And now you have a lot of cameras, photos that are kind of tinted. Grab that tool, click on there, and that will neutralize it. And you're going to find just how much time having a good bit of neutral gray is going to save you in processing your files. There's no more hunting and picking and looking for a place to set the white balance. Uh, again, the, the phrase white balance bothers me a little bit. You know, it makes sense conceptually, but it, it leads people to think they have to set a white balance off of something white. And the real problem is there is how seldom you're going to run into something that's actually true white in the world. You know, we had this in the photo world, in the photo wedding photography world, photographers would be trying to set white balances off the dress. You know, you have a girl in a white dress, 90% of your photos, white balance is done. Fortunately, no matter what you know, tradition says, those dresses are not pure white. They're you know, can be tinted, they have special fabrics, all that sort of stuff. And setting your white balance off of something that's not actually white, you're kind of stumbling right out of the gate color-wise. Because it's important to remember you know, through all of this that cameras and computers really only see color because we tell them how. So if you're saying to the computer, this is neutral, and it's not, the computer has no idea. So that's why that little bit with you in your pocket is going to save you a lot of time. There's all those other squares up there, though. So those other squares are for tweaking that white balance. So the top row is warming grays. So say you, know, you took that portrait of me, was holding this up, you neutralized me, and I look a little bit pale. It's December. You know, of course, I look a little bit pale. You can now grab that dropper tool again, move it along one of the warming grays, and you're going to bring back color to my skin. And that's going you know, to do that quickly and accurately and repeatably. Same thing in the bottom. Neutral's in the middle, and then you can either go warmer or cooler for landscape work. You can see one side has a snowflake and one side has a sun. And again, this is going to allow you to tweak your white balance without having to move around sliders or anything like that. It's just a click. So the bottom card. Uh, does anyone recognize the bottom card? Has anyone ever heard of a Munsell chart before? So this is what's called a Munsell chart. This is a tool that's been used in color management, I believe, since the late 70s. And what it is is a set of known values. Again, these are very specific colors with values that are attached to them. And what the color checker in x rite has done is added in software that works with it. So remember in the very beginning I showed you all those, like the, how each camera has a different version of color. You know, you can take three brand new cameras off the line, test them all for color. They're all going to be slightly different. And then you multiply that out by age of the camera, different models, different manufacturers, and different, let's say, ease of use, how nice you are to your gear. You're going to have variations of colors that you can't really do anything about. So when we do a, a calibration on the monitor, that's a hardware calibration. right? We're doing directly, we're interacting with the video card, we're setting the computer where we want it to be. Fortunately, we can't do that with cameras. Now, there is something happening between your sensor and your output that affects the color. But we're locked out of that. The, the camera's firmware is set by the manufacturers. There's no way we would like to. There's no way we can go in there, start moving stuff around. So what this does is does the same sort of conceptual calibration, but it does it on the software side. So that last bit is kind of a bunch of word soup if you've never done any of this before. So I'm going to shift out of my presentation again and show you a little bit of a live demo in Lightroom. So the software that the Color Checker Passport comes with is there's actually a free standalone software, but there is also a plugin for Lightroom. So I'm going to show you guys this in Lightroom just because it's a bit easier to see. So very basic. This is a photo I purposely shot with an incorrect white balance. This is uh, tungsten lighting, and I shot it with a daylight white balance. So you can see it looks uh, gross. It looks gross. So first step we're going to do, like I said, 
So you go over and you grab the white balancing tool, you grab that dropper, and you neutralize it. Pretty quick that I corrected for that. And the thing is though, and I always try and drive this point home, white balancing is not color calibration. There are, oh, it's, I put it to one of these squares of the nubs. Either of those two are the neutralizing. So white balancing is not camera calibration. There's plenty of ways to get an accurate white balance. But for whatever reason, your camera still could not be rendering colors correctly. So that is where this chart comes in. So to use our profiling software, you drop down, you go to export with preset, color checker passport. And it's going to come up, and it wants you to name the DNG profile you're going to make. Uh, up to you how to organize these. I always name it camera body, lens, and lighting situation. Because obviously the color of the light is going to affect it very much, as is the specific sensor in the camera. But also lenses are going to affect it, unfortunately. Not all lenses are color neutral. Another thing I always try to point out is, is does anyone here use filters on the front of their lens, a UV haze, a skylight filter, something like that? Unfortunately, those filters can also cause a color cache, and you might not even be realizing it. So this is going to compensate for all of this. So this was my D700, 50 millimeter lens, and it's in tungsten. So I would write that in, and I hit save. And the software automatically sees crop marks. As long as this is big enough, you want it to be about 25% of the frame to make life easy for you. The software sees it, drops in, does a reading, makes a profile. Lightroom restarts, the profile shows up. So that's really just a progress bar after I hit save. Again, trying to be nice. I don't want to make you guys watch a progress bar go. So like a cooking show, I, uh, I did some of this beforehand. So once you make that profile, it shows up over here under camera calibration. And you see here the Adobe standard? That's what we redid. We don't want anything more standard. We want it specific to our gear. So drop down Adobe Standard, and there is my D700 50 millimeter tungsten. Now watch the back roll of the pool balls. They shift. Again, for whatever reason, I'll do it one more time, my camera was not rendering those colors correctly. So this brings it over to that standard. Now sometimes the effect can be pretty subtle. That's a pretty subtle effect. Luckily, I have another demo for you guys that is a little bit more drastic, so you can see, really. So this is uh, my cousin's wedding that I photographed about a year ago, which, really lucky for me, I don't have to make them sign model releases because they're my family. Also really lucky for me is that my cousin's husband has interesting taste in pants. So I have these really bright pants to work with color-wise for you guys right here, so it's going to be a really drastic change. Not to mention uh, the really blue Dodge Dart we had to shoot with. So, first shot of the day, I was shooting the groom and his groomsman. I had him hold up the color checker passport. And again, just like before, I'm going to zoom in a little. I grab that white balancing tool, and I click on the neutral, which is the one with the nub. And you can see uh, nothing really changes. That's because the white balance I had in camera that day was very good. It's a daylight. It was a beautiful day. But he looks a little bit pale which, you know, it's about to get married. <laughs> yeah, he's getting married and to my family, so it's, it's pretty understandable that he's a little bit pale. So what we can do now is grab that again, click on one of the warming reds, and bring that color back to his skin that quickly. So then, again, the next step, file, export preset, color checker passport, and this was my D700, happened to be my 50 millimeter lens again. I really like that lens, and this was daylight. So, pops up down here, and let's apply it. So we'll just watch pretty much everywhere. Big shift. So not only did his pants shift, but I'll do it again, you guys can see, the greens and the blues of the car really shift. From using this card, I found out that my D700, for whatever reason, doesn't really like blues and greens. And purples, it also has a pretty lot of problem with it. But now, just that fast, I compensated for all that. You know, if I didn't do that, if I just white balanced that, the grass would look a little bit dead. Those pants that he specifically picked out, they're Rhode Island red, by the way. He's a Rhode Islander. They were married in Rhode Island. They're Rhode Island red pants. They weren't rendering correctly. And that paint job on the Dodge Dart wasn't rendering correctly either. But now, this is what I can do. I have that done. 
grab the rest of that portrait session. Same lighting, same lens, same lighting, same lens. Cross like that. I hit sync. You sync the white balance. You sync the process version, the calibration. You synchronize. Why don't you hit the sync button? The sync button right here. So right here, and you can see here, he wasn't holding up the color checker passport in this, but I already fixed it. And it would have looked like that, which is, you know, I don't have to say, much better. So here is also where the power of the passport comes in. Across town, uh, my buddy, who was nice enough to shoot this with me, was shooting my cousin and her bridesmaids getting ready. So first thing again, he had the color checker passport. You can see here, he didn't set a custom white balance. Bring that in, grab that, neutralize it, and already that's a lot better. Then same thing again, I go File, Export Preset, oops, Color Checker Passport. Now, I mentioned the power of this. He doesn't shoot Nikon. Not only is he shooting a different camera, it's an entirely different brand, he shoots Canon. And I didn't have any access to his gear, but I had his files. So now I can profile his Canon equipment without ever to handle it, and I know we're syncing into the same standard. So I hit, you know, the 5D Mark III, whatever it was, the lighting, the lens, I made the profile, pops up over here, and you can see it's only gonna give me the Canon ones, because now it's gonna be Nikon ones. So watch the floor and the wall. Shifted there too. So his Canon was off on yellows and magentas, my Nikon was off on blues and greens. But now, using the color checker passport, and again, I do the same thing. I grab all the shots from that portrait session. He didn't leave the room. He didn't change lenses. He didn't change hot camera bodies. And I synced them. White balance, process version, calibration. So now, I did two things really quickly. One, I just color corrected two different portrait sessions that fast. And now they match. Now when you give someone that I gave my cousin the proofs, you can't tell a difference color-wise between his Canon and my Nikon. Obviously, you can tell style-wise, but not color-wise. And this, I always say, it gets you to the fun part faster. Because I know, I mean, I teach color science, uh, but I know, really, you guys don't want to sit there moving stuff around to get the color correct. You want to get your color correct, and you want to move on to the fun part. You want to start cropping. You want to start adding filters. You want to start retouching. You want to start adjusting. And this gets you there faster. Now. Uh, just to move on really quickly, uh, does anyone notice something a little bit different about his shot than my shot? Uh, the color checker is upside down. So that will, would make the software fail because it needs to know that those colors are in the right position. So it would see this and it would actually fail. Luckily, there's a simple fix. Yeah, you just flip, flip the image upside down and, and run it again and it'll run. But if you run into issues like that, uh, the standalone software that it comes with allows you to tweak things a little bit more, allows you to tell it exactly where to read from. But luckily, this, this was a quick fix. But the fun part I just mentioned, right? the next step, when you want to start moving from RAWs into another file, you want to start working on them, you want to start sending them to print, you're going to hit File. So is that changing the RAWs, or just adding to the metadata? This is, well, right now it's adding to the metadata. That's the next step is going to start making the next files. That's what I'm going into right now, is when you're making the next files, when you're make, taking the changes that you make, applying them to the RAWs, and then, so you go with export, and this is where we start to delve into the workflow even deeper. This is two very, very important choices you have to make here that's gonna affect your final outcome really greatly. And it's hiding down here, and there's color space, and there's bit depth. So you can see here, color space, there's three, there's sRGB, Adobe RGB, there's Pro Photo RGB, and under bit depth, there's 8 bits and 16 bits. And so, again, uh, sometimes people don't know what to do with these. Some people just leave them where they're set, stock, but it's really important to understand what you're changing around here because you have a huge effect on your files. So, uh, color space is a bit involved. Uh, photographers love to argue about it on the internet. So, we're going to start with bit depth and then we're going to go back into color space. So, bit depth, you can see we have 18 bits and 16 bits. So, what are we even talking about there before we begin to do it? We're talking about the number of shades on each channel, red, green, and blue. You can see it here stepped out. So an 8-bit file has 256 shades per channel. So 256 shades of red, 256 shades of green, 256 shades of blue. So 
Logically, that might make you think that if you're upshifting the 16, that you'd have 512 shades. Uh, because it's photography and nothing is as uh, straightforward as it should be, we're actually talking about exponents here. So 8-bit is 2 to the 8th power, so 16-bit is 2 to the 16th power, meaning we actually have 65,536 shades per channel, which I don't really need this silly chart that I you know, made here to show you guys that there's a huge difference. But um, why is that important? Uh, from this step out, every sort of bit of editing you're going to do to that file is going to damage those shades. You're going to knock out its ability. And do that enough, you're going to lose the, the enough shades to make smooth gradients. Uh, has anybody here been working on like a JPEG or a smaller file, and you're moving stuff around, and all of a sudden the sky begins to sort of split apart? It looks almost like a halo sometimes, and there's really nothing you can do to get rid of that. You put on a blur filter, you try and go back, but you can't really get rid of what looks like steps in the skies. Skies are always the first place you see this problem because they're always subtle blue gradients. And what you've actually done is you've damaged the file so much that you can't make that blue skies gradient anymore. So this is where I always introduce the concept of a funnel when you're building your workflow. You want to start as big as you can to as small as you have to. So if you have to end up at an 8-bit JPEG file for a website, you want to start as big as you can. You want to start with a 16-bit file because you can never go back. You know, if you start with a 16-bit file and you do some sort of like crazy editing where you damage that, you know, lose 80% of your data in that file, you're still going to have like 13,000 shades when it's time to go down to 8-bit, which is still a lot more to 256. And that's going to ensure that you don't lose quality in your file and you don't add in uh, problems, artifacts that, you know, people say makes it look digital. That's a lot of the problems when people say this photo looks too digital. It's because you're actually damaged to the file to the point where you, you, know, you can see the pixels. Now the next one, color space. So uh, I think a lot of people have hopefully seen color space represented this way. So that hoop of all the color, that's the visible light spectrum. And then the triangles inside of it, those represent how much of the visible light spectrum those color spaces encompass. In truth, though, uh, they're actually more 3D. It's not actually flat. And it's for that reason that I like to call, I like to think of them and call them as footprints. So you know, your monitor steps onto the visible light spectrum. Whatever colors it encompasses is its color space. Your camera steps onto the visible light spectrum. Whatever colors it catches is its visible light space. So chasing that metaphor a little bit further, look back at this chart. You can see that sRGB is sort of the footprint maybe from a slipper, from a ballerina slipper. Then we move up to Adobe RGB. Adobe RGB is, we're, we're into sneaker territory, where it's pretty big, it's pretty good. And then we look at Pro Photo, and it's like if Shaq wore combat boots. It's, it's giant. You can see that it actually you know, steps off the visible light spectrum in places, in the blue area and the green area. And you know, if you're anything like me, and you're, you're thinking about that funnel, and you're like, oh, yeah, all of it. Give, give me all the color we can. Start really big, and then I'll, I'll go from there. Uh, unfortunately, things are not that simple with Profoto RGB. Um, Profoto RGB was a color space that was created by Kodak to encompass all likely occurring real world surface colors ever. Um, but the real problem is there are no monitors in the world that can display that much color. Uh, right now, I think we are above, like, a 125% of Adobe RGB, but in that piece that's missing is literally hundreds of millions of colors that you can't see on your screen because technology just hasn't gotten that far. Uh, furthermore, there are about four printers in the world that can print that much color, and they each cost about $400,000 each. So if you can afford a print on one of those, I, I really wish you hadn't come to a free class, <laughs> but in general, uh, you're never going to run into that. You're never going to run into the ability to accurately work with it or accurately output it. So for that reason, I say you can forget about Profoto RGB. Now, um, again, that's just information coming from me for your own setup of your workflow. Um, I don't like working in Profoto RGB because you're always going to have to convert. You're always giving yourself a chance to make a mistake. You know, but if you're someone that is going to be very, very litigious, they're going to make sure that you convert at every step and you convert the way you want it to, you know, feel free to work in Profoto RGB. I, I don't recommend it, but feel free. I've talked to some photographers who kind of, uh, I like to call them optimistic futurists. 
You know, they think that in five years we are going to have monitors that will show pro photo RGB and they don't want to go back and reconvert their RAWs. Fair. Do that. But in general, for a workflow, for most people, you can kind of forget about pro photo. Now, the next step, there's two other left. And so the other two, I really wish I could say to you, you know, the, pick one and stick with it. Fortunately, I can't. Uh, each one has its pro and each one has its cons. So we'll start the middle guy, Adobe RGB. That's the color space you want to be in if you're going to be inkjet printing. Uh, the reason is uh, most high-end inkjet printers' capabilities are very similar to that color space. So if you give an inkjet printer an Adobe RGB file, then it's going to have to do less internal conversions, and that gives you more accurate results. And more accurate results is sort of the name of the game today. However, uh, does anyone here work in that color space? Have you ever tried to post one of those files on the internet? Well, good. Because if you post it on the internet, that's where you run into the problems. That's where you run into the Achilles heel of Adobe RGB. Uh, it's going to shift. It's going to gray out. It's going to basically do um, everything you don't want a file that you're posting on the internet for other people to see to do. And the reason there is uh, most browsers, most internet browsers, are not color managed. Uh, Firefox was, and then they weren't, and they were again. Uh, I think there's ways you can set up Google Chrome to be color managed. But in general, uh, you can't control how people are going to be looking at it. So you don't want to set yourself up for that problem. Now, why aren't internet browsers color managed? Because most screens in the world are sRGB only. And that's true of even you know, my, my MacBook Retina, really nice screen, sRGB only. Those new, you know, the iMacs, sRGB only. The S and sRGB is for standard. It's sort of the lowest common denominator color-wise for the world. Uh, not only are most screens you're going to buy color uh, sRGB only, most labs, unless you're working with a high-end lab, will only accept sRGB files because they have to stick to an industry standard, and that is sRGB. Now, of course, there are many great options for monitors out there for photographic work. Like if you're a serious inkjet printer and or serious about photography, I highly recommend investing in a nice monitor that's up there. Uh, there are now ones, you know, prices are coming down. There used to be crazy, you know, $5,000 monitors. But now, for around uh, $1,000, you can probably get a monitor capable of showing you 99% of Adobe RGB. And so that's, I always recommend that for photographers. You know, we sort of have this weird thing, and I'm guilty of it too. You know, we, we buy lots of lenses. We buy too many camera bags. We have four tripods. You know, we like to buy that sort of stuff but when it comes to the screen, we cheap out a little bit. And it's so weird because you're going to spend probably more, if not the same amount of time, in front of a monitor than you are behind a lens. So that's a really good place to be. But that being said, even if you have an sRG monitor, calibrating it will make it that much better. So really quick, just a sort of a recap, shared with you guys my personal workflow. Again, this isn't a workflow that we did when I worked in uh, production. This is just how I work on my own art. So I start with a raw file, of course, and then I bring that in as a 16-bit Adobe RGB image. Then I do all my edits, I do all my fun, I use my Nick software plugins, I do whatever I want, and I save that as a 16-bit TIFF. And that is my inkjet printing file, that's my bigger file. And then I go back in, and I convert it to sRGB, and I downmix it to 8-bit, and I downres it a little bit, and I just sort of save a nice JPEG for sharing on the internet. So I save those two together, sort of like a little sidecar file. But again, uh, this piece is mostly up to you in how much space you want to use. You know, luckily now, hard drive space isn't crazy expensive, so you can kind of afford to keep a nice high-res file as well as a low-res file. But again, that's up to you. If you have tons of space, you could even move past TIFF. You can move up to just saving PSDs, anything like that, as long as you're retaining the 16-bit. So now, the next step. Have that file that I'm really looking to print. Um, I don't feel a photo's ever truly done until I print it. I love printing. Personally, I love inkjet printing. I love to be able to hold my stuff in my hand. I love to put it on the wall and just look at it and sort of get more an idea about what I've been doing. So this is the next step. Printing. Now, what is the question on everybody's mind when it's time to print? How can I be sure what I see on my screen is what comes out of the printer, be it an inkjet or a lab? 
So the answer to that comes in two parts, profiling and soft proofing. So profiling. There's a few different ways you can start profiling. So this is a screenshot of Ilford's website. These are ICC paper profiles. So what we're doing now is we're going to get a file, a little file, to tell the printer how to handle the ink and the paper that's running through it. So for third party printer manufacturers, which is to say people that make paper but not printers, you can always download the specific profile for your paper and your printer from their website. They're always free. Uh, if you say you own a Canon printer and you have Canon paper, those profiles are already in there. Canon puts all of their profiles in the Canon driver. Epson puts all of their profiles in the Epson driver. So if you're working with you know, Epson paper, Epson inks, Epson profiles are already there for you. Now, totally honest, the manufacturers make very, very good profiles. But again, remember when we were talking about Adobe standard and we said we don't want anything more standard. We want stuff to be specifically for our gear. Another way, you can download, you can install, or you can make your own profile. And you can make your own profile, we turn to this device, which is the i1 Photo Pro 2. So there's two devices. I have the Photo Pro here with me today. If you're someone that's going to be uh, looking into CMYK printing, there is another version of it called the Publish Pro. But because this is a photo class, we're going to talk about the i1 Photo Pro 2. So really quick, I'm going to plug that guy in, and we can kind of see what it looks like. So the neat thing about the i1 is that it uses the same software. So let me unplug the display, plug in this guy. So just while this loads, we do not lock down the software to the equipment. If you buy the equipment, you can install that. You have five computers at home. You can install the software on five computers doesn't work without the hardware. So you can, we don't limit you. There's no licensing use to it like that, especially for people that are running a small studio. We don't lock that in. And you can see that the actual licensing, like I said, is linked to the device. So you can see when I plugged it in, the licensing tab changed, right? Now we have checks on everything except for CMYK. And that would be if you had the Publish Pro. But so now we can calibrate monitors. We can quality check monitors. We can calibrate projectors. We can calibrate RGB printers. We can quality check RGB printers, and we can even calibrate a scanner. Now, the full truth about this device is I could probably teach a class on it alone. It is an amazingly capable device. It's our top of the line device. But so I'm just going to delve in a little bit for printer profiling. And there are uh, many website, excuse me, many videos available on our website to take you further into this device. So we're going to go to printer profiling. You can see here that it's up from when I uh, calibrated my Canon Pro 100 series that we had in the office. And then it's going to give you these charts to print. I have a few of them here. So this is a pretty wide gamut. This is a four patch. We did 2,033 patches on here. It starts at around 800 patches. But again, if you shift it into advanced, you can tell it how many patches you want to check. Again, the more patches you check, the more accurate a profile it's going to build. But so again, like a cooking show, these are already ready. So I hit. Printed them, I'm going to hit next. Next step it's going to ask you to do is calibrate the device. So it comes with this little guy here, and this has a pure white chip in it. That obviously is colored because you want to keep that clean. So you pull that guy down, clip it on, and you hit calibrate. Now once the device is calibrated, which will take a couple seconds, we're going to move on to doing the actual reading. So when you do the reading, it comes with this neat easel. And you're going to clip the page in, slide it over, bring it up here so you guys can see. And the device actually clips in, and you're going to sleep it along, scanning in each row. And again, not making you guys sit through me scanning patches. So we'll do the same thing we did before and pretend like I'm scanning them right here in front of you. So as you scan them, it goes along with you. It tells you each one is red. It reads both ways, so you can scan through. You can pick all the different types of scans you want to do. Now, the, different, the dual scans and the single scans, those have to do with the different inks you're taking in. So if you're using something that's pretty far out there, there are different inks, you want to do a double scan so it reads both types. But 
you can also get away with just doing a single scan, which is what I was doing here. Now, say you don't want to spend the time sitting there swiping in 2,000 patches, especially if you're making a lot of profiles. Uh, we have a few other options that you can add to this device to sort of speed it up. Um, my favorite is the IO table, which you guys can see here. It's actually a robotic arm. So you sort of give it the chart, and it does the scanning for you. Then past that, another one a lot of photographers like to use because it's super quick is the ISIS. And the ISIS is a scanner, and it's a scanner specifically for these charts. So you just sort of make the chart like I showed you guys. You give it to the scanner, scans it, and it makes you the profile. And so again, it's the same concept that we've been talking about this entire time. You know, when you're calibrating a monitor, it looks for very specific colors to see where it's off from the ICC standard. When we're making a profile for our, uh, using, the IC, ooh, using the color checker passport for our camera, very specific colors that helps it know where it variates from the ICC standards. These are very specific colors that the device is scanning to see where it variates from the ICC standard. Then what that's done, you choose which, which illuminant. Again, we talked about, you choose the white point illuminant. Most of the time, you just use the default settings for the profile settings. And then your profile is created. You can see you name it. So this is when I was profiling this paper. This is Ilford's Smooth High Gloss. That's why it's so shiny. So I named it that. And you save your profile. So now, what do we do with these profiles? So whether you made a profile, whether you downloaded a profile, or had a profile already built in, you use it for soft proofing. And this is true even for labs. Remember what I was saying before about you calibrate your monitor just like the lab does? So now you know what you see on your screen is what the lab's going to. Labs will give you profiles. Even if you're printing at Costco, you can actually go onto Costco's website, find the location you're going to, and they will give you a profile to download. And it's the same thing that we just made, but for their printer. Now, most labs that I know of just have them sitting right there on you for download on their website. So we use that soft proofing. I'm going to soft proof in Photoshop just because it's a little bit easier for you guys to see. Now, again, total truth, uh, this process is usually pretty subtle, which is why I had to look for something that was going to shift a lot. And luckily, I have interesting taste in shoes. So I had some really bright red shoes. I had some really bright blue shoes that I was able to use here so you guys can watch it shift. So I'll just get that palette out of the way, make that a little bit bigger. And so what you do is you go to Proofs View, Proof Setup, and Custom. Come in. There we go. So under Device to Simulate, that's where all those profiles are. These are all the profiles that I got from my Epson printers. These are all the profiles that I got from my Canon printers. The one highlighted there was the one I made for Ilford Smooth Pearl. Ones in here I've downloaded. This would also be where the lab profiles would show up. And what you can do, you can go through and watch the red of the shoes. You can see it change live. You can see how these colors would be affected by not only this paper, but remember these printers. All printers have different abilities to create color. If you have a printer with four inks, it's not going to be able to create as much color as a printer with 12 inks. Then the next big question you're doing in the soft printing, so let's go. We're going to do it with one I made for Ilford. Smooth Pearl, 310. So that's how much it's going to shift. And the last real choice here is rendering intent. So this is where you're telling the printer, whether it be your own inkjet or the lab, what to do with all the out of gamut colors, which is to say cameras, uh, colors that a monitor can make, but a printer can't. So there's four here. There is perceptual saturation, relative color metric, and absolute color metric. Now, two of these we really don't have to worry about so much. Um, saturation is a rendering intent you would use for printing charts and graphs, where the difference between the colors is important, but not so much the specific hue. Absolute color metric is for times when no colors can shift, basically medical printing, right? where you can't have any color variation because then you're going to get an incorrect diagnosis. But for photographic work, we have perceptual and relative color metric. And again, thanks to soft proofing and our calibrated monitor, you can go back and forth and see how things are affected. But what are we actually doing? So like I said, this is where we tell the printer what to do with the atagamic colors. So when you choose relative color metric, 
what you're saying is, Take all the out of gamut colors. So that circle there is the gamut. All those colors hanging out in the middle are the colors that the printer can make. And those sort of satellite guys are out of gamut. When you choose relative color metric, it takes all those out of gamut colors and maps them in to their nearest in gamut equivalent. So a really big pro there, if you notice, all those colors that were already in the circle, they didn't, they didn't move at all. Nothing shifts there. Only the out of gamut colors. However, there can be a bit of a problem. Again, I'm going to bring up the example of skies or sunsets or even or flowers, things where there's a gradient that goes out of gamut. If you map them all into the same in gamut equivalent, they're going to sit on each other. And if you have, I want to say again, on like a sky, they all come back in and they sit on the same in gamut blue, you're going to get banding. It's going to look like steps in the sky because you're telling it to map it all to the same place. So if that happens, you have the option to go to perceptual. So perceptual really just takes everybody and sort of squeezes them a little bit so everybody fits in. But if you notice, stuff moved. So you can cause an overall color shift by choosing perceptual intent. But you'll avoid the banding issue. And again, this is why Soft proofing is so powerful because you get an idea of what's going to happen before you send it to a lab, before you send it to the printer. And it's a really valuable tool, saving you, you know, time and money. The worst thing ever is sending out to a lab and waiting a few days for your prints to come back and having them be completely wrong. This is going to save you from that. Now, if you were to go to print, so let's see, let's go back and forth, let's say. What do you guys think? Perceptual or relative color metric? I'm going to say relative color metric. We'll go to that. And then when you go to print, this is how you set up the dialog. Now, again, in full honesty here, a lot of times that effect is going to be very subtle. Remember, I had to go find my silly shoes to show you guys a big enough shift that you could see on this screen. Uh, if you're not shooting stuff that's going to be out of gamut, you might not have too much of a shift whatsoever. You know, if you're shooting a normal landscape, you probably won't have a ton of shift. It's still good to check, but it may not be as drastic as what I'm showing you here. But for people that are doing something like you know, flower photography, you might have even more shifts. That's why this little preview is so powerful. So this is the Canon Pro 1. I believe we did it with the Pro 100. And you always go here. See, it shifted it. You always change it from printer managing colors to Photoshop manages colors. You never, if doing all this work and then handing it to the printer and letting the printer do what it wants is negating a lot of the stuff we did. The printer is doing what it thinks it's right. You never want to do that. You want to make sure Photoshop manages colors. And then we're going to choose, where did that go? The profile I made. Oh, maybe it was the Pro 1. There we go. Pro 1. And then relative color metric, just like we chose in the soft proofing. Send 16-bit data is checked, because that's going to give you that extra sort of information. New modern printers can all take 16-bit data. And then I would just hit print. Obviously, I don't have it here with me today, a printer. But then you'd be good. So we've gone all the way through a very basic thing of setting up a workflow. And it's not as scary as it sounds. Um, there are plenty more uh, stuff for you available online to help you go through this. Um, xrightphoto.com under their learning tab. There is a, uh, you know, probably around 1,000 webinars archived there. We do uh, webinars all the time, actually tomorrow and Thursday. There's going to be live webinars that you guys can see again if you want to watch videos on that. There's also a uh, website called calibratecolor.com. There's videos on there specifically on the Color Checker Passport on the i1, taking you through it step by step. There's sort of visual manuals for stuff like that. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.